Hi everybody, so today we're going to talk about inverse functions, but before we get to that, we're going to talk about what it means for a function to be one-to-one. -one. So we'll look at the definition and then we'll look at some examples. Okay, so we say that a function is one-to-one -one if each output value has no more than one corresponding input value, right? So you don't want an output to have two corresponding inputs or three corresponding inputs or whatever, okay? So let's look at some examples of functions that might or might not be one-to-one. -one. Okay, so we're gonna look at if the function is one-to-one. -one. If it's not, we're gonna give two example points that prove why the function is not one-to-one, -one. okay? So first, we're gonna look at a function that's represented by a table of values, okay? Okay, so here we're going to look, okay, and we're going to see if each input has one corresponding output or more than one corresponding output. So you can see for the output 2, okay, you have two different corresponding input values, negative 2 and positive 2, okay? So we would say, no, this is not 1 to 1, okay? And my points that prove it are the ones that have the same output, 2 and 2, okay? But they have two different corresponding input values. Okay, so those are the points that show this is not 1 to 1 because they have the same output and two different input values, okay? Okay, so if we look at this, we're going to check for one, is there another input besides negative two that leads to the output value one? No. Okay, you can see that all these inputs, none of them lead to one. Okay, so then for zero, does any input, okay, negative one leads to zero, but anything else? No. For negative one, there's only one input that leads to the answer negative one. For two, there's only one input that leads to answer two. And for negative two, there's only one answer that's leading to that output, okay? So we would say that yes, this function is one to one, okay? All right, so let's look at some functions that are represented by diagrams, okay? So same directions, but we're just gonna look at diagrams. Okay, so here with this diagram, you're checking the output, right? So you look at each output, so we'll start with this one, and make sure that it's only coming from one input. So this output comes from this input, this output comes from this input, this output comes from that input. So because they're each coming from only one, we would say, yes, this is a perfect example of a function that's one-to-one. -one. Okay, let's look at another example. 
Okay. Now you can see for the first output, there are two corresponding input values. So that's exactly what makes something not one-to-one. -one. You can't have one output value with two corresponding input values. Okay, so this function is not one-to-one. -one. Let's look at one more diagram. Okay. Now here we're seeing each output value is coming from one input value except for this one. Okay, This output value doesn't have any input value. Now that's actually okay. This function is still one-to-one. One-to-one -to -one is about whether or not two things map to the same answer, right? You don't want to have two x values with the same y. This is not important. Okay. All right. So let's look at some uh, functions that are represented by equations. Okay, so we're looking for, is it possible to plug in two different x values and get the same answer for y? Okay, so if you plug in two different x values here, is it possible to get the same value for y? It's not, which means that this function is one-to-one. -one. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, what function doesn't have that property? So here's an example that you guys are pretty familiar with. Okay. So is it possible to plug in two different functions, or two different values for x that have the same value for y? Yes, absolutely. So you could plug in negative one and positive one, for example. Okay, so this is a reason that this function is not one-to-one. -one. Okay. Now the last thing we're gonna look at is functions that are represented by a graph. Okay. And we're going to look at two functions that should look relatively familiar. Okay. Now we're looking for one y value that has two corresponding x values. Right, so the y values are here, so you're looking across to see if there's any y value that has more than one corresponding x value. Well, if you look, each of these y values is just gonna have one corresponding x value because there's only one point for each y value on the graph. So we would say, yes, this is one to one, okay? Now, for example, here, we could look at this, Okay, and say that these two x values have the same corresponding y value. Okay, so we would say, here, let's mark these so we can list them as points. Okay, so we would say that these have negative 1, 1, and positive 1, 1, right? The same thing that we saw above, you have two different x values with the same y value, okay? Which means that this is not 1 to 1. Okay, now there's a name for that with graphs. Okay, that's called the horizontal line test. Okay, it's a lot like the vertical line test for uh, functions. Okay, this is the horizontal line test. It tests to see if something is one to one. Okay, so if a graph crosses any horizontal line. More than once. Okay, the function is not one to one.
right? So you're looking for points of intersection with horizontal lines. If you get more than one point of intersection with any horizontal line, that means your function is not one-to-one, -one, right? And that's basically exactly what we were using on this example, right? We were looking at values of y, which is looking at horizontal lines. Here, you can see each horizontal line has exactly one point of intersection or down here, none, okay? But here, all of these horizontal lines are gonna have two points of intersection, meaning this is not a one-to-one -one function. Okay, now let's talk about whether or not, uh, why we're talking about one-to-one -one functions when we should be talking about inverse functions. Okay, so I will, you guys should have seen one-to-one -one before, you should also have seen inverse functions before. So if you wondered why we were going a little bit fast, this is why. Okay, so the idea of inverses, okay, is that these are opposite functions. Okay. So these functions undo one another. Okay, so you guys should be familiar with this example. Some examples of this are like plus two and then minus two, okay? You might have like times five and then divide by five. Okay, those are examples of functions that undo one another, okay? So let's look at the precise definition. So we would say that two functions are inverses if f composed with g of x is x and g composed with f of x is x, okay? You really do need to check them both. We'll see an example of why, okay? But these are composition like we talked about in the previous section, p.9, okay? So this is the precise definition of what it means to be an inverse. Now, this does relate to the undoing one another idea, okay? Because this says if you do x, or if you do g and then f, you haven't really done anything, right? So if you added two and then you subtracted two, you haven't really done anything. So that's the same idea. Okay, so you would see that here as if you subtracted two and then you added two, you haven't really done anything. Okay, so that is still the idea we're getting at here. This is just a more formal definition. Okay, so let's do an example of checking on some inverses. Oh, let's do some notation first. Okay the inverse function okay so the notation looks like this right this is a minus one you still have function notation and you say this as f inverse of x. Okay, so hopefully you guys have seen that notation before. I will just remind you that this minus 1 is not an exponent. It doesn't have anything to do with exponents. It doesn't have anything to do with fractions, and it doesn't have anything to do with negative numbers. Okay, that's just the notation that we use. All right, so now let's get to our example. Okay, so we're going to check if these functions are inverses. Okay. 
Okay, so first we're going to do f composed with g of x, and then we'll do g composed with f of x. Okay, again, you really do need to check them both. So this is what we did in p.9, or yeah, in p.9 about composition. We're going to take g and plug it into f. Okay. All right, so this is the function f with the function g plugged in. Okay. So this two is going to cancel with this one. Okay. And I'm going to get just x. Okay. That leads us to believe that these probably are inverse functions, and we're going to check the other composition, g composed with f of x. Okay, so in place of x here, okay, we're going to input this entire function. Like that. Okay, so first we're going to combine like terms. Okay. And then we're going to cancel that common factor of 2 to get x. Okay, so by definition, are they inverse functions? Yes, they are. Okay. All right, so let's look at another example like that with some different functions. Okay, now this looks plausible, right? We have the cube and the cube root. We know those are opposites. We have plus one and minus one. Those are opposites. Okay, so let's go ahead and check on this. Okay, so I'm going to take F and plug it into G. Now, this is why your radical skills are important in this section, okay? Is the cube root of x cubed plus 1 just x plus 1? It's not, okay? So this is not equal to x plus 1 minus 1, okay? So it's not x, okay? So at this point, we could right away say, no, these are not inverse functions, Okay, now the same thing would happen if you checked the other way. So you don't need to do this, but I'm going to show you what would happen if you checked the other way first. Okay, so we would have cube root of x minus 1 cubed plus 1. Okay, now I'm going to have to multiply this out. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so from here I am going to get cube root of x cubed, which is x. Then here I'll get minus 2 times the cube root of x squared. Okay, then here I'll get plus cube root of x. Okay, now from here I'm going to get minus cube root of x squared. Okay, then I'll get plus, I'm going to write these right like this. Okay, then I'll get plus 2 cube root of x. Okay, and then I'll get minus 1. All right. So this is going to give me x minus 3 cube root of x squared plus 3 cube root of x minus 1. Okay, and then I have this plus 1 that's out here. Okay, so you can see Okay, this is not x, so you would also find in this example, right, if you had checked this composition first, that they're not inverse functions, okay? 
match. If you get no for one of these, you don't need to check the other one, but I just wanted to show you guys that either way you checked, you wouldn't get that these are inverse functions. Okay. All right. Now, let's talk about, um, I'm going to assume that you guys remember how to plug things into inverse functions and how to evaluate inverse functions from tables, equations, and graphs. But let's actually talk about how you can um, find the inverse function. Example number am I on three? Okay. So I'll remind you of how this works. Let's use our one from our previous example. So let's see if we did have this function, okay? What would be the inverse for this, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do here, oh, I should probably use function notation. Duh. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, and that's why I thought of the function notation, is we're going to switch out of the function notation. Okay, and now we're going to isolate our x. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is add 1 to both sides. Okay, and then how do you get rid of the cube root? Well, you cube everything. Okay, cube root of x cubed is x. All right, so now that we have our x isolated, we actually have our inverse function. Okay, so here's our inverse function. So I'm going to ask you to recall that your inverse function actually does take in y values, right? It takes in input output values and it outputs the corresponding input value. So this really is a function of y, okay? And consequently, you can leave it like this. If the question specifically asks for f inverse of x, all you have to do is change the variable. Right, you guys know that variables are interchangeable. So this is the inverse function, there's nothing wrong with that. And this actually shows that inverse functions take in y values and output x values. But if the book or if the quiz or whatever specifically asks for f inverse of x, then make sure you change to this form. Okay, so there's a reminder of how to do that. Okay. And let's look at the graphs of some inverse functions. I'm also going to ask you to recall this fact about the graph of inverse functions. Okay, so you should know this from your Algebra 2 class. There is a lot of stuff in this section that should be previous knowledge. Okay, but the graph of a function and its inverse are always symmetric across the line y equals x. Okay, so we're going to look at some examples of how you can graph the function. Okay. 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 
So we're going to graph the line of symmetry, and then we're going to graph f inverse of x. Okay. Okay, so just to be clear, this is the absolute value x, or the um, the square root of x graph, the base graph, okay? And so I've marked those two points, okay? You can mark this point too, 0, 0, although I just kind of figured that one was clear. So we're going to draw in the line y equals x, so that would have this point and the point 2, 2, okay? Maybe the point negative 1, negative 1, like this. Okay, so we're going to graph that in as a dotted line, like that. Okay, this should be showing a little bit above that line. Okay, and then we're going to graph this, the f inverse of x, sorry. So we're going to reflect these key points first. So this is on the line of reflection, and so is this. So those key points are going to stay. And then I'm going to reflect this, right? So it reflects from 4, 2 to 2, 4. Okay, so that's going to be up here. All right, and then we're going to just draw the reflection. The points give us something as reference, but you can also kind of see what the reflection should look like. So. I'm going to smooth that out, but that should be my graph f inverse of x. Okay, let's do one more of those. Okay, we're going to do um, a more unusual graph just that so you guys have seen one of those. Okay, so this is a piecewise graph, so it is a little bit more unusual, okay? So first we're going to draw in um, the line of symmetry, which would go right along this line here, okay? So when you reflect the graph, this line is actually still going to be part of the reflected graph, okay? So we're going to leave that there. Now we are going to reflect this point, so it's going to go from uh, 0, 1 to 1, 0, Okay, and then this is going to go from negative 1, 2 to 2, negative 1. Okay, and then we're going to draw what we know is the reflected image, like that. Okay, so our reflected image is this and this line segment here. Okay, so now you guys have seen kind of a more normal example with one of the base graphs and then this strange piecewise example. Okay, so... The last thing we need to talk about with inverse functions, and this is what I think you guys maybe haven't seen before, is the domain and range. Okay. So remember, the inverse function takes in y values and outputs x values, okay? So that's why this is the case. The domain of the inverse function, remember it's taking in y values, that means it's going to be y values, right? So that's the range, normally. Okay, and then the range, okay, remember it outputs corresponding x values. So that means that the range is going to be the domain of the original function. Okay. So because the inverse function is taking in y and outputting x, it switches the domain and range of the original function. Okay. All right. So... Let's do maybe one more example.
Okay, so we're gonna find the inverse function and then we're gonna state its domain and range. Okay, so just like the previous example where we found the equation of the inverse function, we're gonna change from the function notation to the normal x and y notation. Okay, and then we're gonna try to isolate x. Okay, I wanted to do this example because this kind of solving actually comes up a lot and I think at this point you guys probably haven't seen too much of it. So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply both sides by 2x plus 5. Okay, so here they're going to cancel and here I'll get 2xy plus 5y. Okay. It's at this point that it's super important that you remember what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to isolate x. So I'm going to put all my x terms on the left, and I'm going to put all my other terms on the right. It doesn't matter what they are, okay? And now I'm going to factor out an x. Okay? And the last thing I'm going to do to isolate my x is to divide by 2y plus 1. Okay. So this would be my f inverse of y. Okay. 3 minus 5y over 2y plus 1. Okay. Now, because the question specifically asks, I'm going to give this answer as f inverse of x. So I had 3 minus 5x over 2x plus 1, okay? Not changing anything except the variable, right? Variables are interchangeable. All right, so then I'm going to state the domain and range. So we're going to look at the original function, okay? Now the domain of this function, okay, is going to come from everything except where the denominator is 0, okay? So for f, okay, we're thinking about f first. So we don't want 2x plus 5 to be equal to 0. So that means we don't want x to be negative 5 halves, okay? All right. Then for the range of this, you could really look at the graph, I think is the simplest way. Okay, so you might want to look at the graph of f of x here, okay, but let me double check, I'm pretty sure that the range is everything, okay, I'm going to say from the graph because you guys can graph these on your own, okay you would say that x is not equal to negative one half, okay? That would be a horizontal asymptote of that graph, all right? So then for f inverse, okay, the domain is going to be uh, x is not equal to negative one half, which is going to look like negative infinity to negative one half union negative one half to infinity. Okay, and the range is going to be x is not negative 5 halves, so negative infinity to negative 5 halves, union negative 5 halves to infinity, okay? So the domain and range are actually switched. Now, this can be helpful if you don't actually know the range of your function, Okay, if you weren't able to graph this or you couldn't tell from the graph what the range was, you could actually look at the inverse function, find its domain, and that would give you the range for the original function. Okay, since it is easier to figure out domain than it is to figure out range. All right, I hope that refresh your guys' memory about some inverse function stuff. If it's not enough, let me know, and I have additional videos for you, but I'll see you guys soon.